You have entered the crypt of life. You are permitted to explore the many tales that we have stored. Enjoy your visit. Story one. This happened at the very end of the summer that just passed. A little backstory. About a year ago, me and two of my exploring buddies decided to explore a huge abandoned brewery. This brewery had many sections and buildings to it that were split on opposite sides of the abandoned property. There was the main buildings on the right side of the train tracks and on the left was the manufacturing and bottling buildings of the brewery. The first time we explored this place, we were only able to explore the side of the brewery that was on the left side of the tracks. It was still a very large area, but not even close to as massive as the area there was to explore on the right side of the tracks. Our first explorer of this smaller section of the brewery was perfect. There was minimal graffiti, no security, and nothing even remotely creepy took place. It was excellent. We tried to make our way into the main building through at least three or four covered bridges and tunnels we found, but they were all locked up tight and impassable. We decided that was enough exploring for the day and went home believing the place was completely explored since there was no way into the larger sections of buildings on the right side of the tracks. A few months passed after that and I happened to come across a post online that showed pictures inside the main and much larger buildings of the brewery. Right after I saw that, I knew we had to go back and complete the explore. I figured in the months that had passed from our previous explore, someone had gone in with bolt cutters and opened up more ways into the main brewery buildings. I tried to get my buddies together, but our schedules for work didn't seem to line up. About another month passes and I wanted to go back and explore the brewery so bad that I couldn't think about much else. I got tired of waiting for my buddies that didn't seem too keen on exploring the place and contacted one of my other friends that was interested in urban dwelling but had never done it. After a bit of planning, we finally set a day to explore the main buildings of the brewery. We arrived on the brewery property as the morning sun was still rising and easily found a way into the main section of the brewery. It was amazing. I saw many things in there I had never seen on any of my other explorers and the buildings were even more cavernous than I could ever imagine. After me and my buddy had been exploring the place for about an hour, we began to feel a bit uneasy. The first occurrence that spooked us pretty good was when we entered a very large room that was in very good shape, about four floors up. It still had carpet and nice paint and there was no graffiti. There was a small door all the way across the room that caught our attention, so we decided to see where it went. When we opened it, we were in a very dark hallway that was filled with massive storage tanks on both sides of the hallway. We took a few steps in and we were stopped dead in our tracks by an echoing, whistling tune. It was too complex and patchy to be a bird's call and we couldn't tell where it was coming from because of the loud echoing of it. I turned to quietly ask my friend if he heard it and I could see that I didn't even need to ask him since his eyes were round as saucers and he had a shocked expression on his face. I motioned him to quietly leave the hallway and I followed him. Now this might seem stupid, but I told him that we should keep exploring, but also avoid going further into the wing of the building we were currently in. My common sense was being overruled by my desire to explore the rest of the building. We explored for almost two more hours and finally found our way into a large office building. That was the last building on the property we hadn't explored yet. This is where it got creepy again. We started seeing more and more clothing on the floor and I suspected if the homeless was going to live anywhere, it would be this building. It was in good shape and was the furthest away from any entrance to the brewery complex since the way we got in was through an underground tunnel. I rounded the corner at the end of a long hallway and the first smell that hit me was cigarette smoke. Not the smell of cigarette residue that walls and carpets can smell like, but the smell of a cigarette that was just smoked within 10 minutes of us getting there. 
This made us both very uneasy. Again, I decided to push forward to explore just a little more of the building since I had been looking forward to this for months and we were so close to completing the explore. We made our way to the second floor and I became convinced people were living in the abandoned brewery. I poked my head into a room and saw a pile of clothing, shoes that looked new, and some food on an old office desk. Nobody was in that particular room, but at certain times throughout the building, I could hear faint shuffling noises. That was enough for me and my buddy to call it quits. We explored the whole complex despite being very creeped out at times and decided staying any longer and looking for any rooms we missed wasn't worth the risk. On our way out, we found even more food, including a full moldy pizza and a large chicken breast that was still fresh. I loved that explorer, and I believe it was my best explorer yet. The location was so unique and massive, it was my favorite location I've been exploring, but it's also a location I won't ever be revisiting. In my mind, it's just not worth the risk. Story 2 I saw a little boy that was never there in a tunnel where a bus full of children supposedly died and now I believe in ghosts. I am on a mobile phone so excuse me. I am a 23 year old. There was a time I didn't believe in ghosts at all. I am a psychology student and used to think that everything can be chalked up to someone's own anxieties and fears. That was until last year. This happened in Colorado Springs on Gold Camp Road. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, you know that this place is a hot spot for urban legends and creepy ghost stories. The road is located on the side of a mountain and has several large tunnels dug through the mountain that you have to drive through, overlook the city, and hiking trails. There are also all sorts of scary stories that I'm sure you've heard if you grew up in this area. The story goes that a bus full of small children crashed within one of the tunnels after it partially collapsed and the spirits of those children are trapped in the tunnel. Supposedly, if you drive into the tunnel at night and come to a stop, turn your lights off and put baby powder or flour on your windshield, little ghostly hands will smear the powder all around. Also, I'm not sure if this story has any validity to it, but I've been told a lot of people dump bodies over the side of the road. The clips in heavy wilderness apparently make it a good place to hide evidence. Anyway, this was all bullshit to me. I would drive the Gold Camp Road about once a week during the summer, as it was a beautiful night drive to take with friends. And there are several pullover spots to smoke pot with relatively certainty that you will not encounter any police. Now, I won't be offended if you think that's the fact that I was a little stoned may have contributed to what I saw. Anything is possible. Anyway, my friend, a 21-year-old female, and I spent about an hour one night smoking, walking around the scenic spots, playing music until about 3 or 4 a.m. Again, we have been doing this exact routine all summer, and we're used to the deep, creepy tunnels in the heavy woods at night. And this particular night was no different. That was until we started ascending to the peak. I'm not sure how to describe the feeling of getting to a certain point on the mountain, but it felt like a distant passing over. That was a specific moment I remember feeling that we were in a completely different location. It was kind of like the moment in Spirited Away when all the spirits came out at night in the city in the beginning. It was like nothing was there and we were alone. And suddenly it just felt extremely populated. We couldn't see anything and it was still dark, but it was like there was energy all around us. It was like the sensation of being in a loud crowd without anything physically happening. I started to feel really uneasy and my friend told me she was getting a little creeped out. I told her it was okay. We were almost to the second tunnel and then we would descend. We entered the tunnel and the headlines lit up everything to the end. That's when I saw it. A very distinct, clear as day little boy was standing just to the right of the tunnel, almost touching the wall. He didn't look exactly like a real boy that would be standing there, instead like an overexposed film photograph of a little boy. My friend and I both gasped and I slammed the brakes dramatically and then, just like that, it was gone. Now I don't mean he disappeared, I mean we realized he was never there. You know that shock you get when you wake up in a dark room and see a jacket hanging on a door and for a split second 
you're convinced that someone is standing there. But as soon as your eyes adjust, you realize there was never anything there. It was like that. But there was nothing that we could have mistaken for any type of figure. The tunnel was lit up by my headlights and there was not any kind of rock formation or pattern on the wall or anything. Just smooth rock wall and the bright light of my headlights. I have never seen anything like it. What convinced me is that my friend saw it too. And neither of us had the stereotypical reaction of mistaking something for a ghost. Like just jumping or feeling a shiver. I slammed my brakes because I was positive there was a child. And then suddenly there never was. Most bizarre experience I've ever had. I will never doubt the existence of the paranormal ever again. All I can say is don't always discount urban legends. They have a funny way of reaching out to you. Story 3 This happened to me a few years ago. I'm a female in my early 30s living in a major Canadian city for some context. I live in an older inner city building that is mostly full of hipsters, young urban professionals, and senior citizens. So needless to say, it's considered a very desirable and nice area to live in. For the most part, everyone in my area is pretty chill and even the local homeless population are always polite when they are collecting bottles. One of my former neighbors is one exception to this, but that's a story for another time. For some background to my story, my apartment unit on the first floor of the building that's flush with the ground, besides my kitchen and living room is a large sliding glass door that leads to my patio. Because I'm on the first floor, it's often easier if a friend or family member has to drop something off to me to just go to my patio and I'll open the sliding door to see them versus going down the hallway through a million doors to the front entrance. As well, the people above me are super lazy and don't like to go down the stairs to let their guests in personally. So they drop their keys from their balcony down to their people below. We can't buzz people in as a security feature feature of the building. As a consequence of this, I got kind of used to having people lingering outside my window. Sometimes creepily staring at me while I make dinner or something. Weird, but manageable. One night, I'm sitting on my couch, watching Netflix or something, and I get this odd feeling of being watched. I keep my blinds mostly open because I don't like feeling closed in. It was dark outside, but when I looked, I couldn't see anyone there. So I go back to watching TV. A few minutes later, I hear two soft taps on my glass. Tap, tap. Now I like to think I'm a fairly intelligent woman who can handle herself in most situations. However, this night my logic went out the window and stupid took over. My friend's fiance had just dropped something off to me just yesterday and I was so used to random people just lingering outside my place that I thought, oh, their key must have dropped on my patio again. Or, geez, uh, what did they forget at this time? So, instead of being a logical human being and looking out the window first, I just opened my sliding door. Big mistake. Hidden in the corner between my railing and the opening of the door was a man. He looked right into my eyes and gave me the most bone-chilling clown-like smile I've ever seen. He then proceeds to slowly move his fingers to his lips in a V-shape and wags his nasty tongue between them. I'm sure most are aware of that crude gesture. He then motions for me to let him inside. I'm sure he would have said something crude to go with it, but he didn't appear to know any English. I freeze for a few moments that felt like forever. Finally, my backbone magically returns and I yell at him to go away, pointing at the street. He smiles that sick smile again and indicates to come in once again. I yell that I will call the police and slowly he walks off, looking back at me as he goes down the street. I close and lock the door, then proceed to call the police. They come but were unable to locate the man. I'm left shaking trying to understand what came over me to cause my serious lapse in judgment, which is very out of character for me. I don't want to think about what could have happened if he didn't just slink away quietly and decided to be more forceful with his intentions. It also worries me that this creep is still out there lurking around and watching women in their homes just waiting for one to let him in. 
So to the PP pervert, let's never meet again. And I hope you're not still hanging around waiting for your next opportunity. Story 4 I'm a college student that lives in a suburban city of a larger urban city in Texas. The college I go to used to offer student housing. The housing was not a regular dorm though. I'm about to move out since the program was recently terminated. This is why I figured now is a good time to share this story. The school had a leasing deal with a nearby apartment complex. So it was not only students that lived here, but also regular tenants. I moved in about a year ago. In July of 2017, going in blind when it came to my roommates. There were four of us sharing a two-bedroom apartment. The three guys living there, let's call them Justin, Josiah, and Greg, had been in the apartment for over a year, all of them upperclassmen compared to me. We lived in apartment 204. The apartments in this specific complex were townhouse style. As I said previously, the city was very suburban. Our apartment was on the second floor. Basically imagine a two-story house with two front doors, one that leads to the first floor, the other to a staircase that leads to the second floor. Each floor is a full two-bedroom apartment with a living space and a full kitchen. We also had neighbors connected to the building on the opposing side. Their apartments had the same layout as ours. The story is about the tenant that lived underneath us, apartment 203. I never personally met the tenant, but he never really actually appears in the story. Let's call him Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was an older man, a Vietnam Army veteran. He was handicapped, so we actually traded parking spots in the driveway with him. Since 204's spot was closer to his door, this way he could get to his truck easier. He drove a large white pickup truck with a wheelchair mount on the back. As far as I understood, he was in a wheelchair and on oxygen. Obviously, not very mobile. My roommates told me about him when I first moved in, explaining that the few times they had met, he was a very kind and well-mannered man, even going as far sometimes to knock on the door and just make sure that everything was okay and checking if they needed anything. One time, even giving them the extra groceries that were delivered to his apartment that he had not ordered. At one point, Justin had actually had a conversation with Mr. Jones when he was outside having a panic attack. So as you can tell, Mr. Jones was very much a quiet and kind old man. Every once in a while, some, what we assume was family, would come and visit Mr. Jones. Through the encounters I'm about to tell you about one that was very different. Early one morning, probably between 2 to 4 a.m., Hard to recall because I'm a deep sleeper, so all I know it was the early hours of the morning. The flashing lights of an ambulance shine through our windows. I assume that something happened to Mr. Jones. He was an older man. It was common sense. Honestly, we was never really worried much about it either. We went on with our lives. The truck remained parked in the driveway, and we figured he was either in his apartment with family or at a hospital. One day, almost a week since the ambulance, on a Saturday afternoon, I heard some pounding from the kitchen while I was cooking. I could not really tell which apartment it was coming from, so I made the assumption that it was someone in the adjacent building nailing something to the wall. Or at least it sounded like that. Then the same day, it happened again. Once more, I assumed that someone in the adjacent apartment was doing some redecorating, hanging some things on the wall. Then again, I just brushed it off and assumed it was nothing more than a hammer and some nails. Sunday comes around. Usually I'm out of the house until the afternoon on Sundays. I get home and unload my groceries and proceed to sit on the couch in the living room. Justin and Josiah are home, both gaming in the living room. We proceed to hang out for a few hours. Greg gets home from work, eats dinner, and proceeds to go into the bedroom to take a shower. It's a Sunday night, so the Walking Dead is on. We turn on the cable and switch the channel to AMC. The three of us are on the couch and watching, mostly in silence. Suddenly, pounding. This time we know where it's coming from. Boom! 
Boom. Boom. It's coming from underneath us. We can feel it through the floor. We feel the pounding on the floor. Let me also state, we have never received noise complaints. We are four college-age guys living in an apartment, so we're not silent, but never loud enough to disturb any of our neighbors, including Mr. Jones. The most noise we would make is simply walking around the apartment, conversing, watching TV, and every now and then, my roommates will open and close the door to the balcony to go outside and smoke. I asked my roommates if this happened any time earlier in the day while I was gone, and they said it had. I explained to them it happened the previous afternoon as well. We also realized that there was an additional car parked in Mr. Jones' driveway that we had never seen before. The license plate was from out of state, Louisiana or Arkansas, if I remember correctly. We continued to watch our show in silence. Boom! 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 We decided to just ignore it. The next day, we had a similar schedule. All of us were home in the evening, Justin, Josiah, and I, watching TV in the living room. This time, we decided to binge through early seasons of SpongeBob SquarePants and Greg in his bedroom showering. Suddenly, we hear pounding again. Great. It happens a few more times, then something new. We hear pounding on our front door. Greg comes out of his bedroom, fresh out of the shower, and decides to go downstairs to answer the door. He looks through the peephole and doesn't recognize the figure. He opens the door. It's a woman. She starts screaming at Greg. I don't know what the fuck is going on up there, but you guys need to shut the fuck up. Seriously. You have neighbors here, and you are all up there stomping the fuck around. You need to quiet down. I will call the fucking cops if you don't. Shut the fuck up. I will give you $30 to shut the fuck up, okay? She proceeds to throw $30 in $10 bills at Greg. He simply says, okay, sorry. She walks away and slams her apartment door shut. Greg walks upstairs and says to us, I don't know what you guys were doing while I was in the shower, but I'll give you guys the $30 because obviously I had nothing to do with it. Then he sarcastically says, so just shut the fuck up, okay? We all laugh and split the... $30 between the three of us. We go back to watching TV. About an episode and a half later, we hear another knock on the door. At this point, we are absolutely fed up. Greg goes to answer the door again. This time, the woman is much more well-mannered. Justin, Josiah, and I are listening from upstairs, trying to stay as silent as possible. The woman says, I just wanted to come by and apologize. I shouldn't have acted the way I did. I brought you this as a sort of peace offering. We can't see what it is, but then we hear Greg say, Oh, so you're smoking us out, so we know what she has now. Yeah, I guess so, she replies. Well, I kind of have a lot of homework to do right now, so I probably shouldn't be smoking. Homework? What kind of homework? Well, I go to art school. You know, I'm really good at homework. Like, really good, she says, centrally. At this moment, we are upstairs freaking out, trying to... Try not to break down laughing. How old are you, she asks. Now this is getting weird. He replies, 21. As we are upstairs trying to stay silent, we miss the tail end of the conversation. Next thing we know, she's walking up the stairs of our apartment with Greg. We're in shock. She's about four and a half feet tall, very thin, almost sickly looking. Blonde hair, about shoulder length, wearing a pink t-shirt, light blue, blue boot cut jeans, Plain black shoes and a black, what I would only assume was a cloche hat. A floral tattoo on her upper arm. She appears to be in her 30s. It was hard to tell. Grant says, hey guys, this is um her. She is smoking us out as an apology. She never said her actual name to Greg or any of us. She says hello and sits down on the couch next to Josiah. Justin is sitting in a chair adjacent to the couch. I am standing across the room. She looks at the three of us and asks, So what are you? What are your names? I guess I'm her, she says sarcastically. I know all three of us had the same thought. Do we give her our real names or fake names? We don't know this woman and she's creeping us the hell out. So she looks at Josiah first and he says, I'm Josiah. Since he took the lead and used his real name, Justin and I decided to do the same. Greg is in the kitchen at the table near the balcony door packing a bowl. She walks over as he motions to her, and he opens the door to step out and smoke with her. 
She looks at the table, three pipes, since the three of my roommates all smoke. Then looks at us and says, are the rest of you coming? Greg can see our discomfort and makes an excuse. Oh, these are all my pipes. None of them smoke. I just like to use different ones. Personal preference. She doesn't think anything of it and follows Greg onto the balcony. The three of us are inside contemplating what to do. Justin texts his girlfriend to let her know what's going on just in case anything crazy happens. Josiah does the same. I keep my phone handy in case we have to call 911. Time goes by and the balcony door opens. Red walks in with her following. She drops her jar on the concrete balcony, all her weed spilling onto the ground. She then goes on a tangent about women's pants not having enough big pockets. Let me remind you, she was trying to fit a glass jar in a pocket. Kind of odd for someone to even attempt this without the thought that it might not work, especially when you have pockets as shallow as she whined about. She picks up her weed from the ground and walks into the apartment. She looks at some of the art on our walls, which is all ours, we're students in art school, and says, I could probably get you some better art than this. We look at each other, knowing we're all laughing at her comments internally. She then proceeds to leave, small talking with Greg as he walks her out. We ask Greg what happened on the balcony. He explains that she basically poured out her life story to him and shared why she's here. Apparently, she's the daughter or granddaughter, some sort of close family to Mr. Jones. He has slipped into a coma and is in the hospital about to die. We, of course, sympathize with the story. It's sad, but also it's not an excuse for her odd and deranged actions. We are absolutely relieved that she is gone and go on with the rest of the night, joking about the encounter, but at the same time feeling uncomfortable and concerned with what just happened and knowing that she is still underneath us. The next day, Josiah says he saw her in the morning when he went to his car to leave for work. Supposedly, she was going to her car at the same time. She never started it or left, just opened the door, looked for something, and went back into the apartment. It's quiet and back to normal for a couple of days. Her car stays in the driveway. Boom, 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 pounding once again. And we hear her yelling something. We can't make it out through the floor. She goes on like this a few times. We're not letting the situation escalate. She threatened to call the cops on us for noise, but had no noise com to complain about. We did, and we knew our neighbors would be able to back us up based on how loud the pounding is. I googled the non-emergency police sheriff line for our county and call. This is the county sheriff's office. How may I assist you, says the operator. I explained to her the occurrences of the past week. She takes down my address, phone number, and name. I'll send out a cruiser to your apartment. Fifteen minutes go by, and I receive a call from an unknown caller. It's the officer in the cruiser. He's lost in the apartment complex, and I direct him to our building. He pulls up, no lights, and parks in the street. He exits the truck and walks up. I thank him for his time and explain to him the situation. Justin walks down to join the conversation out of curiosity. The officer says he's going to knock on the door and try to talk to her. Justin and I walk back up to our apartment and we're all staying silent trying to hear what happens. We hear the officer knocking on the door, not pounding, but not a soft knock either. Silence. Knock. 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 Silence. He tries this a few more times. We're looking at our window, trying to see if the cruiser is parked outside still. We wait and see it parked and hear no sound. Eventually, he leaves. We hear nothing from her for the rest of the night. For that matter, we don't hear from her ever again. Her car eventually disappears, and that was the last we saw of her. But that's not the end of the story. Soon after the white truck disappears, we assume something happened to Mr. Jones. Then people start to appear almost daily, loading things out of his apartment into their vehicles. One of my roommates asks one of them that he runs into on his way out, and they tell him that he passed. This is what we assumed happened. Mr. Jones passed, his truck is gone, and that's that. Josiah graduates and moves out. Justin decides to move out with Josiah. It's just Greg and I now. Since the truck is gone and Mr. Jones has passed, we start to park in 204's parking again. Our school emails us and says we're getting a new roommate. 
Let's call him David. David moves in and we tell him about what happened. He's as shocked as we were when it happened. Then we get another roommate. Let's call him Jack. We also tell Jack the story. He doesn't really seem to have a significant response. He was a pretty tame guy anyway. Kind of quiet. One day David gets home from work and says, You guys said the guy underneath us died, right? We respond, yeah, why? There's an old guy sitting on the couch in the window downstairs. I can see him because the lights are on and the blinds are open. I recall seeing the lights on sometimes. I thought nothing of it. I do believe in paranormal occurrences and figured that could potentially be the case, but it's not in my encounter, and honestly, I am still clueless. None of us want to go down there to check. One day, I get home from class, and David says, Hey, so I was leaving for work this morning, and an old guy with fucked up legs and a walker came out of the apartment downstairs and asked if he could have his parking spot back. I told him sure and just went on my way. It was pretty creepy considering what's been going on. I'm shocked, surprised, worried, curious, and clueless at this point. Let's just start parking in 203 again, and we'll figure this out eventually. So that's what we do. Once we move our cars, a new vehicle appears in the driveway. A nice new crossover van. Out of state, Florida license plates. We're even more confused now. We're talking about it almost daily. He's supposed to be dead. His family told us himself. I saw that dude, literally, in that apartment. He walked out of it and talked to me. There's no way he's dead. People were there taking things out of that building just over a month ago. He has to be dead. If anything else happens here, you know, I'm out of here. The black guy always dies first in the movies. I don't do paranormal shit. I decide to take the matters into my own hand and figure this out. I go to the front office of our apartment complex. The woman at the front desk says, Hi, how may I help you today? I say to her, Okay, so I have an odd question about some weird occurrences that have been going on. I live in apartment 204 and I explain to her the whole story. But summarize it so it doesn't take as long. She says to me, apartment 203 is Mr. Jones. No, he definitely did not die. There's been no word of that at all. Matter of fact, I just saw him the other day. This is weird. Her told us Mr. Jones slipped into a coma and was about to die. Then family members are showing up to the apartment to remove furniture and boxes. His truck disappears. It all seemed to make sense and come to the conclusion that he was dead, but supposedly we were wrong. I thanked her for the information and go back to the apartment to share the info with my roommates. We're satisfied enough to let it go. Not long after that, the crossover van from Florida disappears and the parking spot is empty. Now, now I'm about to move out. The spot is still empty, the lights turn on and off, and I've yet to see a natural person inside the apartment or a person that claims to live in the apartment. I guess I might never understand what happens in apartment 204. Story 5 Hello everyone, I'm here to tell you about the weirdest thing that has happened to me. I live in a town a little ways from Denver. There's nothing notable about our town except that it's nearby Mount Etworth. There is a huge spread of forest area and our town is basically nestled by it. Mostly firs and pines, everybody who lives here is used to the forest and as a kid I've roamed and played in the forest enough times to not be creeped out by it than some of us who live in more urban environments would be. There's not many accidents or happenings that happen around here. Usually folks know not to wander off too far into the wilderness without telling the ranger and the forest service. The Forest Service does a good job of marking or trail paths used by hikers and such. Honestly, there's been only two cases as far as I can remember, which I would call weird or creepy, and the one that I'm about to tell you happened to me last week. Let me introduce myself first. I'm 24 years old and I'm a male. I graduated from college a few months ago and decided to visit my parents. I would stay there for a few weeks while I was looking for an apartment of my own. So me and my father have hiked a lot since my childhood and it was the father and son time that we mostly don't see anymore in this generation. Mom would join us sometimes 
but most of the time it's just me and dad. It's December and we're tracking, which is pretty normal for us. We've been getting five inches of snow and even a park ranger had warned us that it was a mess out there and to be careful. If it was a stranger hiking, normally a ranger would go with them, but the servicemen know us well enough as regulars to let us off seeing that we've been doing well all the time. Now let me tell you something about forests and particularly wintertime. Hiking through a forest is a challenge and at nighttime it's a whole nother beast. But during the winter it becomes a cold rangy monster that even the strongest of us, of us will cower from. It is during the winter that nature shows its cold slumbering ferocity that most of us hide from in the safety of our warm houses. During snow season, particularly during heavy snowfall, it is extremely easy to get lost. In spring or summers, you have tree markings or rivers or the forest service signs to guide you and keep track of you or where your trail is. During winters, the snow covers everything and even expert hikers will have trouble navigating through it. My father, confident that he knew this place like the back of his hand, was the one navigating us. And after about an hour and a half, we both realized that we were completely lost. We tried to trace our way back, but anyone who knows a thing about heavy snow is that finding your way back is pretty much impossible. Every side we looked, there was just trees and snow. Everything was frozen for miles and miles. A simple tip, when you are lost, not to panic and stay together. We consulted a map and kept moving south, which according to dad, to take us to the end of a forest service post. We found a trail and a weathered old forest sign that said Valen Creek, but my dad said he had never heard of it before and he was sure he had hiked through all the trails in our forest. He had grown up and lived here all of his life. In fact, we've lived here for almost five generations now, something my father is particularly proud of. So we kept moving from the south and that's when it happened. We were walking down this narrow trail and from the left tree line, we see something coming towards us. At first, we think it's an animal because of how tall it was. But as it comes closer, it becomes obvious that it's human. It has distinctly anthropomorphic features. So that's why I assume and I wasn't mistaken. It was a man. Well, at least that's what I think it was. Before I go any further, I'll give you a description of this man. This guy was tall and not like human tall. I'm 6'9 and my father is 5'9. I'm considered extremely tall in my family. Actually, I'm the butt of many tall jokes during any family gathering. This guy was 8 or maybe even more. He towered over us and looked slightly hunched. Another thing that made him look even more taller was how incredibly long and lanky he was. Almost anorexic, he was so emaciated. His arms almost came down to his knees and his legs looked like tree branches. One of the first things that I noticed about him was that he was barefoot. Now anybody who has ever lived in a place with even moderate snow knows that nobody walks barefoot in snow. In a region where there's heavy snowfall like this, everyone owns a pair of snow boots. This guy was not just barefoot, but he seemed to be not hindered by the cold or anything. He walked normally and his feet, which should have been blue, red, or sore, seemed perfectly fine. I am noticing all of this, that his nails were out certainly long and broken the kind you don't normally see in a person. Ethnically speaking, he didn't see Caucasian. I don't know, his skin was a bit tan and his features were just not Caucasian, you know. The closest guess I would make would be an Indian, and by an Indian, I mean Native American. A description of his clothes is just as weird. He was wearing like an old tattered gray jacket that was clearly torn in many places and we could see his emaciated and thin chest, not to mention the hollow bones. It was clearly not his size since the sleeves only reached half his arms and we could see his long and gangly arms. His pants were more like shorts. They reached just above his knees and even that was torn on one of his legs. His hair was long and reached way past his shoulders. It was like a caveman who had been dying of hunger put on an old, thrown away, raggedy suit. There was snow in his hair, plastered to his face, his lips everywhere. That's all weird enough, 
But it got even weirder when we walked up to us and just stood in front of us. Just hummed up nothing. He said nothing, but just stood there looking at us. Now, I don't know about my father, but I was just so weirded out that I spoke up. Hello, I said. He didn't say anything, but his head slowly turned towards me, and it wasn't like a normal thing. It was like his neck was made of wood or something about it was so mechanical. Are you okay? My father asked. Obviously, this guy looked like he needed help. Now, the whole time we were there with this guy, I couldn't help but feel that something was wrong. It was just this gut feeling that something was very unnatural about what was happening. I think I didn't realize it back then because it was all so surreal. But now that I'm here, sitting in my home, I realized what was making me so uncomfortable about this guy. He hadn't blinked. The entire time we talked to this guy, he hadn't blinked a single time. And I'm sure our encounter lasted at least three to four minutes. Another thing that's especially creepy, in my opinion, is the way he moved. Not moved the entire time we were talking to him. He didn't move a single muscle, except the time he turned his neck towards me. And when we walked, he was just weird. Like his body coordination was off or something. He was breathing in large heaves. You know, like someone who was jogging or running, gasping for breath. This guy was heaving for breath, but his nose didn't flare or seemed like it was drawing breath. I don't know how to put it, but the unnatural and uneven way he was breathing made it almost seem like it was artificial. Like he was not actually breathing, but pretending to breathe and exaggerating it. He didn't say anything, just stood there staring at us. As the minutes passed, I began to feel that something is very wrong here, and that we were in the wrong place and we shouldn't be here. I could see the same uncomfortable feeling on my father's face, and he's stroking his beard, a thing he does when he's nervous or when he gets into a fight with mom. About three or four minutes into this stare contest, we hear a sound from our right, and it seems like it's coming from miles away. I'm sure it was an animal sound. I've heard it before many times, and coming back home, my father told me that it was a male buck. We hear this sound, and this guy turns his head towards it too. He raises his arms towards it, points a finger at the direction where the sound came from, and lets out a similar sound. A male deer's bellow just louder, probably because he was so close to us. Without saying anything, he just starts lumbering towards the direction and walks off into the trees until it's just gone. Me and my dad are just standing there wondering what the fuck is happening. After just standing there in shock for like 30 seconds or so, my father tells me to keep moving and we continue down south. We find a forest service post there and the two officers stationed there tell us to the way back to the main trail. They ask us where we're coming from and my father tells them that we got lost and found Valen Creek. Now I'm not sure and maybe it's just my imagination but when, when all, one of the officers heard Valen Creek he just stiffened up you know like when you say something wrong or offensive and their eyes lose that jovial, humorous shine they have. His partner just said that that area of the forest was closed for hikers and that the main office had issued a blizzard warning and we should probably head on our way back before we got caught in it. That's all of it. I don't know who or what that man was, but it was so weird that I can't explain it. Back at home, my father tells me there are a lot of weirdos out in the world and I should be careful if I was ever out on a hike. That's it. We haven't talked any more about it, and we probably never will. Now, I'm not trying to make heads or tails of this. All I want to say is, if you're out on a hike in a forest in Colorado, please be careful.